Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're just going to wait a few more minutes um, to let some more people come join us. Uh, thank you for coming to today's webinar. Um, uh, my name is Justine Bokanek. I am the program coordinator of the Faculty um, And I'm speaking today with Bronwyn Crowder and Cindy Marvin, and they are our instructors who are experts on family cycling. Um, I will go into more detail uh, when everyone has joined us, but maybe while we wait, uh, Ronwin and Cindy, um, could you tell me maybe about a recent bike ride that you've done in Victoria or the greater Victoria region? Bronwyn, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure, I'll go first. Um, you know, I haven't been cycling a lot myself um, because I have the young kiddos at home, but I did get out. Um, a few weeks ago from my house here in Tanner Ridge, kind of by Elk Lake. And I did a big loop into kind of the um, Hunt Valley area near Cadova Bay. It was like a beautiful morning. It was like, gets lots of fog down in that area. So it was like, um, of course, like a late spring um, fog down there. And, and then I rode up to Elk Lake. So up Sayward Hill, which was a good warm up for a 6.30 a.m bike ride and then I looped around on Old Field Road and then back to my house. So it was just a nice morning, get out of the house. Um, I hadn't started really doing a lot of working out yet since having my second baby. So it was actually one of my first times that I got my heart rate up. I had just bought a new running and cycling watch. So it was kind of like, let's see how high my heart rate can go. <laughs> um, so that was my kind of recent one. That's awesome. That's yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I remember the, the first rides after my son. My son is 16, so I'm at the other end of the spectrum. So um, I think I'll just mention a ride he did recently. I think it was Wednesday of this week. For the first time, he went out on his own solo ride and he rode to um, the ferry, uh, Schwartz Bay and back and uh yeah he just got up in the morning and decided that's what he wanted to do and and off he went so you know it made me think back to all those years ago when i first put him in a trailer you know and took him to to daycare or to go visit my parents house or whatever and you know it was kind of cool to have that come full circle and it was kind of timely just before this this webinar too so yeah Oh, what a nice proud moment. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I have to admit there were times when you think to yourself, I don't think this kid is ever going to want to ride a bike again because he has this, <laughs> you know, this mother that's the... <laughs> no, yeah. we had a lot of fun actually on our on our bikes. We've done some bike tours. Um, last year we went to Galliano Island and we rented electric bikes and uh, he and I and uh, we rode we rode around there and the, the summer before that we went to pender so we we really enjoyed some rides together but this was his first solo ride so i thought that was pretty cool yeah. <laughs> well awesome uh we have some more folks joining us so maybe we can just get started um i'm just going to do a quick introduction of our speakers today uh we have uh, Bronwyn, who is a part-time cycling instructor with the Bike to Work Society. She has two young boys at home and her days consist of exploring new trails for the two-year-old on his Strider bike. She's looking forward to expanding her cycling options as the kids grow. Cindy has enjoyed riding bikes for over 40 years. She's a CAN bike cycling instructor and has also taught courses to the Bike to Work Society. She has strong interest in inspiring more women and families to bike, both in women's and families, uh, sorry, women's families and senior cycling programs. Uh, she also says life's a journey and better by bike. Uh, the presentation itself should last about 35, 40 minutes, uh, leaving plenty of time for a Q&A with Cindy and Bronwyn after the webinar. Uh, during the webinar, we encourage you to type out any questions you may have for our presenters in the question box, which is found control panel, which, which should appear on the right side of your screen. All questions will be saved until the Q&A period. However, any questions that we do not get to can be emailed to myself after the webinar. If folks experience any audio or visual problems during the webinar, I would suggest closing down the 
program. And then re-entering using the same link you would have used to get in just now. Um, anything you might have missed will be available on our website in the recording of the webinar by early next week. Uh, for those just joining us now, welcome. Once again, this is the Bike to Work Society's Family Cycling Riding with Kids webinar workshop with Cindy Marvin and Bronwyn Crowder. And I will let you both take it away from here. <laughs> Thanks, Justine. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Bronwyn, as Justine said, and uh, thanks for coming to our webinar today. I hope you find some inspiring and interesting um, pieces of information that you can take away uh, in riding for your kids, or even if you do ride with them now, um, some kind of extra tidbits for uh, gear and, and rules of the road. So just a few of our topics that we're gonna cover today, knowledge about cycling, what bikes and gear for when, cycling skills, Riding together and routes, and then some cycling resources for you. So, family cycling, it, it starts with you. So, before riding with kids, uh, you need to have good bike handling skills yourself. So, here's just five tidbits. Um, there's plenty more, but these are kind of the big highlight ones that come out. Position on the road. So, thinking about if you're riding on a bike lane or not. Um, try to ride about a one meter away from the curb or parked cars. This helps uh, limit um, if somebody's opening a parked car door, uh, but it also provides kind of the best place for visibility on the road and gives you enough room to maneuver around anything that might be near the curb and such. Uh, second kind of point, don't pass cars on the right at the intersection. I know kind of as a cyclist, we feel like we can zip around those long bike or road cues around cars, um, but if there isn't a bike lane there, don't squeeze in beside um, the cars because that kind of puts you in a vulnerable spot where a car could turn right and not see you. Number three, ride as far right as practicable. And this is a word that they use in the Motor Vehicle Act. So riding to the right as far as you feel comfortable and that always depends um, you know, if there is a bike lane or if not, but keeping to that right side. Number four, ride predictably. This is one that comes up a lot in our courses um, with youth usually that we kind of say there's a time to ride, um, you know, in a parking lot and stuff and do jumps and tricks. But when you're riding on the road, try and be predictable so that cars or other cyclists or people walking um, have kind of a comfort level when they are passing you. Again, that's following the rules of the road, um, using signals, stopping at stop signs and, and red lights. Number five, communicate with vehicles. So a few ways that we do that as a cyclist um, is uh, through hand signals for turning. We can also use that um, through eye contact and we use that with um, lights in the, in the dark at evening times with a white light in the front and a red light in the back. Um, if you don't feel that comfortable to just jump onto the road, it kind of depends on your experience. Um, definitely practice, like take, take your bike to a quiet street, a cul-de-sac, um, practice those shoulder checks to make you feel that you're comfortable. You know, once you add children to the mix, um, riding the bike kind of becomes the secondary thing that you're going to be focusing on. Um, there's other options as well uh, to taking a course. So the Bike to Work Society mm -hmm. does offer courses usually, and um, there will be one this summer later on as well. So knowing the rules of the road, next big thing to think about. Um, make sure you know the rules of the road and that you're comfortable with them. Uh, the Bike Sense Manual, that image there on the left side of the screen, um, is a manual uh, with basically Victoria, or sorry, British Columbia information, the Motor Vehicle Act. And it's a really good guide and reference to look at. So you can find that online if you just search bike sense manual it came up pretty quick for me it's a pdf copy or uh, the bike to work society we've got a bunch of copies at the office so you can just email justine and they're happy to share some of those manuals there um, one thing i wanted to highlight was the signaling so a common confusion that i've heard from a lot of riders and novice riders it's about signaling so it's a, definitely an important part of riding um, as a vehicle is required to use a signal, same with somebody that's riding a bike. So 
uh, there's two ways to show that we're turning left, and that is with one arm straight out, and then, uh, sorry, two ways is to show that we're turning right. So that's, I think, the, the big confusion part. So the, uh, the left arm uh, bent up means turning right, but you can also just point your right arm out. And then again, with the left arm, it is pointing out. So I always encourage um, people to try both ways. And I think that confusion comes from that, using that left arm up for a turning right. But again, another option is just basically you're pointing which way you're gonna turn. Um, another thing for cyclists, if they're kind of feel nervous about taking their hands off the handlebars, and this happens a lot with children, is just start to practice slowly. So taking just a few fingers off the handlebar to start, um, or moving up to just your hand off. And again, what you're trying to make sure you can do is keep a nice straight line ahead so you're comfortable riding, put your arm out and do your signal and then come back down. So it definitely takes practice. I do find that um, lots of people taking the right hand off the handlebar feels less comfortable. So again, it's just something that's an easy practice thing that you can do. So, Another rule of the road is uh, in, in BC, helmets are required um, to be worn when you're cycling. I saw this image on the right on the North Park Bike Shop Facebook page and I just had a chuckle of it and I asked them if we could share that. So that's Christine from the bike shop, she's the owner there. Just kind of showing um, other ways that helmets can fit or do fit, especially with children and youth. Um, their heads, you know, they grow so fast, they change so fast that really helmet fit is definitely an important key part of that. Um, and a trick to having that helmet fit, and I'm going to show you guys if everyone can see my screen, I brought my helmet today inside. So I want to make sure that it's nice and snug first off. A lot of people have the little clasps in the back. Mine doesn't, but it's nice and snug so I can do this and it doesn't jiggle off. And um, what's it up here? So we use a two for one trick and I always like to remind, I think usually the little kids like this, I'm like, everyone likes two for one pizza, right? So this is the way that you remember that your, that your helmet's fitting right. So two fingers, you put on your forehead, that's how much you want to fit. Again, like Christine's showing, you don't want it too far back or forward. Four, so you take your two piece fingers and you put them by your ears. And what you want is those little clasps to be right under your ears. Lots of those are a little bit tricky to um, maneuver, but sometimes if you take your helmet off and, and move them around. Mine usually slide down quite a bit of time, so I might find every time I'm riding my bike, I slide it back up. And then one, so you want just one finger to tuck under your chin here. Loose enough that you can still breathe, but it's nice and snug. Um, definitely bike shops are a great place to um, ask if they can you can try on helmets. I suggest you know giving them a call these days to see if they would let you come in and, and try some helmets on, but um, definitely a good key point to kind of keep checking yourself and your, and your child's helmets um, for fit. Now I'll just hand it over to Cindy. She's gonna talk a bit more about um, age-related options for bikes in vivo. Great. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, yeah, I think, first of all, we're just going to start with a poll. I think Justine has a poll for us because we were interested in finding out how old your kids are roughly. So um, we'll just, she'll put that up for a moment and um, we'll give you a moment or two to, to uh, fill that in. And Justine, you can keep me posted as to how that's going because I don't see the poll here. So. <laughs> So we've got about 75% of the folks voting. We'll leave it open for five more seconds. All right. So what do we have for our results? Uh, so 71% uh, said their children are between one year and nine years old. Nine, okay. say 10 plus, and then another 14% say all of the above. Oh, okay. So 10 plus, uh, sorry, another 10% are all of the above. Okay. So we've got a good range of, um, a good range of 
uh, uh, parents of a good range of children ages here, which is good because I think our um, our presentation is really a good kind of overview of um, what it's like to ride with your family with children of all these different ages. Um, so yeah, that'll, that'll there's probably going to be a little bit of something for everybody here, which which is good. It's nice to see. Um, the one to nine age group being probably more uh, heavily represented, I guess. Um, so I guess I'll start first with uh, the obvious uh, start at the beginning, less than one year old, um, like this, like uh, Francis Braun one's little one right now. Um, so I think the key points for children that are under one are that um, because of the head, the skull and the neck uh, development or maybe lack of development, um, it's not recommended that you 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 put your children in a trailer or a bike seat at that age because they might not be able to sit up very well or they're you know they just don't have strong enough necks. And also another thing is bike helmets aren't made for children under one really and it's just not uh, not recommended either that they would wear them if they're in a car seat, for example, in like in this situation here. Uh, in the image. Um, so what's, what we're showing in the image here is cargo bikes. Some of you probably have seen them around town, maybe you even have one. And um, in this case, um, the mom has three children in her cargo bike and the toddler and four-year-old have their helmets on and the little one who's less than one is, um, is in a car seat actually sitting in a cargo bike. And that is one option for traveling with, with very young children like this. And um, some of this is really up to the parent, what they feel comfortable with, what their, uh, their safety consciousness or level of you know, comfort is really um, for riding with their children. But this is definitely an option and it's used in um, different places around the world, really, um, the cargo bikes. And they're certainly becoming a lot more common here. When I first started riding with my son um, 16 years ago, 15 years ago, it was very, quite rare to see one of these. I would see them in videos on, you know, on, on, on YouTube, but that's about it. <laughs> Um, so after my son turned one, I put him in a trailer. We had a trailer and he used that till he was basically too heavy for me to tow and too big to fit in the trailer. So that was, uh, that was my way of getting around. So um, I'm just gonna, the next age group uh, I'm gonna talk about is ages one to nine. And obviously there's a lot of development that goes on in this, in this age group. Um, the children develop uh, physical and cognitive abilities and they, advance from being towed or carried on your bike or an adult's bike to piloting their own bikes in the company of adults. And um, so that's kind of why this is grouped together. It's essentially, it's that those ages where they're mostly towed or carried to just being on the precipice of, you know, being able to pilot their own bikes somewhat independently. Um, so there's two main facets really for children to become confident bike riders and one is the development of the bike handling skills and one is the development of the traffic safety knowledge and skills and um, these two things uh, proceed at different paces through these years um, in the beginning i guess there's more focus on the bike handling skills so they start with their trikes and their strider bikes and those sorts of things and then they move up to their two wheelers and and then at the later end of this age group, they start learning more about the traffic safety skills. But the key points for this age, for these ages are that the adults generally make the traffic safety decisions. Um, when you're riding with your children, you're pretty much gonna be the one in charge of deciding where you go, how you get there, you know, um, deciding when and where to stop at intersections or crosswalks, that kind of thing. And um, until children are nine or 10 years old, this is something I learned, was that they're not really able to judge speed or distance very well. So if you have a younger child coming up to an intersection and they have to decide whether or not they, the car is far enough away from them that they can cross the street safely, you know, it's something that they're not cognitively quite ready to do yet. So um, keep that in mind. Um, for the younger children, like from say one to six or seven, depending on the size of your children. And as I learned the differential between your size and your child, um, you tow or carry your children usually. Um, and then at ages eight or nine, it's more of a transitional time. Um, so at that age, they're gonna be more interested in maybe riding their own bicycle, like the little girl in the image here um, with, her, with her mom and siblings. 
I assume, on, on their bicycles. And, um, and so at that age, they can go longer distances on their own bikes, um, but they may not have the traffic skills quite ready. So adults should all, you know, should be along, you should be accompanying your children, perhaps an adult should be accompanying your children at that age, just to help teach and model um, good traffic skills and, and to be there for those bike handling uh, wobbles and things like that. Um, for longer trips at that age group, uh, I don't know if I have that in the next one or not. Okay, I'll just stay here on this slide. But for the longer trips, you could consider using a tandem or a trailer bike. And we'll talk more about gear a little bit later. I'm mainly here just wanted to focus on what kids are maybe capable of doing. Um, given their ages and sizes. Um, but I guess also at the upper age limits of this group, uh, like at seven and eight, this is a really good time for bike skills courses, traffic safety courses to start so that they start building that foundation for riding up um, that they'll have when they get a little bit older. And then um, in the next group, uh, originally I had nine to 12 because I realized that, you know, um, I, I first put some of these slides together when my son was about 13 and it ended there. So I've added ages 13, 15 and 16 plus because now my, my family's at those ages and I, and I can add some insight there as well. Um, but for nine to 12, um, your youth can start riding their own bikes um, with an adult on quieter routes. This is all very much dependent on your own children's um, abilities, their character in terms of, you know, how risky they are, how, how risk tolerant they are, um, and what you're comfortable with them doing. Um, and, but I guess for all of this from, nine to 16, as I put here, um, traffic conditions become more of the constraint rel relative to ability or distance. Um, because I learned that my nine, 10, 11, 12 year old could go 10 miles, 12 miles easily, but it had to be on a, you know, a relatively safe route. So for instance, we would go on the goose for, for trips and things like that but um, you know, maybe not on a busy road. So um, yeah, and then ages 13 to 15, that was an interesting interesting time because, because sometimes the confidence grows maybe more than the skills and the, and the development of, of assessing risk and judgment. So that 13 to 15 is, a, is an interesting, interesting age for children riding bikes, um, but I was, I guess, I think somewhat fortunate. My son is a little bit more risk averse. So, you know, I, I, I felt a little better. Um, but at this age, he, he still rarely rode by himself. Sometimes he would ride by himself on quiet routes, um, short distances. Um, but yeah, he didn't really start riding more on his own until the last year or two. So 15, 16. And as I mentioned in my, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe some of you weren't um, yet signed in, but uh, just this last week, my son took his first real long solo ride out to the ferry and back. And um, so I put uh, on my bullet point there, if the traffic knowledge and bike skills are sound for the riding environment. And also there's a certain issue around personal security. So again, you know your own children and what you're comfortable with in that, re in, in that regard. You know, um, it's no, in some respects, that's no different than walking alone somewhere, you know, the personal security issue. Um, Let's see. Okay, I think I can move to the next one. Oh, and that will be Bronwyn. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Um, so now we talk about more about the gear um, and bike options that we have. So for smaller children, you know, one to three years old, uh, bike boxes or cargo boxes, trailers, and bike seats are kind of the best suitable options. This photo here is a, another instructor, Mia, with her daughter Georgia. And so she's got a bike seat on the front of her bike there. So uh, I think she's about a year in that picture. Um, I have not just tried um, one of these seats with my kiddos yet, but um, for what she says, she does love it. Um, she sits up there. There's a nice kind of padded spot there. She's even fallen asleep, I think she said on there. Um, so there's also seats that go on the back of the bike. I think those are pretty common seats. There's some pretty nice ones out there this, these days. Once they get about up to you know 40 pounds, it can be, that's about the max that they would hold. And also just remember that it does add that kind of extra weight to your bike. So um, when you do have more weight in the back versus the front, it does kind of change the, the center of gravity in your bike and 
uh, just have to be really mindful about how you start and stop and I mean primarily things um, bike trailers uh, bike boxes for older children I mean if you have multiple children um, they're definitely a good option because you can usually put um, two two in there and um, trailers are definitely handy sometimes the trailers can turn into strollers as well so and again in the strollers this is a reminder that they're still required to wear wear helmets there um, sometimes you can even put a little pillow in the back just to make sure that the helmet doesn't tip forward over their face Another good option is these uh, carrying toes uh, using a bike box and long tail bikes as well. So uh, for even you know older kids, this is a great option to use. Uh, the bike boxes or cargo bikes can be tricycles, so they can have a third wheel uh, for more stability or just two wheels there as well. And then long tails um, is a bike where it has a longer frame in the back, as you can see on the photo there, and it's kind of got a a top frame for the kids to sit in and, and hold on and they've got even a little seat there as well. Um, electric assist has kind of expanded the options for these bikes um, where it does kind of broaden your length that you can go, the topography, how much weight you can take. So definitely um, something that's really prelevant in the last few years and, and that the price points for these types of bikes are coming down, which is great. I also wanted to mention um, that in August, there'll be another webinar about um, cargo bikes specifically. So if that's something that interests you, um, you can talk, chat to the scene, the scene or something else will be posted online about that soon. Cindy, you wanna talk a little bit more about uh, trail bikes? Yeah, so um, after you grow out of the, uh, the long tails and the trailer bike or sorry the uh, trailer stage um, there are some options for uh, uh, this kind of an awkward age I guess between eight nine ten when um, your kids are riding their own bikes probably but they're they're not really large enough um, big enough <clears throat> to maybe go longer distances um, maybe their traffic sense and uh, or their ability to ride on on streets you know piloting their own bikes even with you isn't isn't you know going to work really for some some places that you need to go so yeah these are some options um first um my family uh, used a trello bike as the one in the the picture on the right there and that worked really well until my son got too big and uh and then we switched to a tandem and um and that was a lot of fun too um i would note though that the trello bike in this photo i realized after i put the photo up there uh, the adult doesn't have any fenders on his on his wheels, and that's actually really important to have when you're trailing your child behind on a on a well either in a trailer or on a trailer bike like this, because your wheels uh, shoot up dirt and rocks and things like that. I mean, it might be okay on a you know a fairly clean street, but um, yeah, your child is going to get some stuff in his face if if you don't have any fenders. So I would definitely recommend fenders, and also even consider some glasses um, just to protect his eyes or her eyes. And um, in terms of the tandem, um, we chose a, that's actually our tandem, that's my husband and son. Um, we chose a tandem with a, a low, um, it doesn't have a top tube, if you notice the second part where the second, uh, where, where my son is sitting in the back, the, it has a, and it, it works well for a smaller person because they can, it's almost like a step over, they can step over it and we were able to lower the seat enough for, uh, to fit his leg length. Um, one thing you have to be aware of, though, is that because of the location of the pedal of the back rider uh, relative to the back wheel, it's easy to get the foot stuck in the wheel at the back because they often won't have like a chain guard on them. And, uh, you know, we learned that by uh, by experience. So it's something just also just to be aware of if you decide to go that route. But it's it's a great option for those intermediate years before your child is just a little bit bigger and can ride longer distances with you. Um, on the streets. Um, also, there's different configurations of tandems are very cool. We just picked this one up uh, downtown uh, secondhand uh, from one of the old bike shops they were sending them, selling them. But uh, you can get uh, tandems where the, the child sits on the front in front of you. Um, yeah, and different. And also, the other thing is this type of tandem, which is more your standard tandem, the, uh, the, the rear rider has to pedal in sync with the front rider, but you can get some that uh, freewheel. So if your child decides to stop pedaling, you know, 
um, it's okay. The it you know the his pedals will pause, but um, but with this one, our son had to get used to always pedaling along with my son and that with my husband, and that took a lot of um, coordination between the two of them and communication, which didn't always go smoothly. <laughs> Um, but it was fun. And uh, so, yeah, these are just some kind of wild and crazy family gear that, you know, that some of you may may have seen, may even use. Uh, some of it, it might be a complete surprise to you that this is even possible. Um, the one in the top left corner, I actually saw here in Victoria and uh, chatted with the, the woman who was, who was piloting this amazing uh, rig. Um, yeah, so these are some options for if you have multiple children in your family and you want everybody to all ride together, here's some ideas. Um, one thing I guess I would like to point out though is that um, you know when you you look at these, you you it's really important that you understand that you know the weight and balance issues with these larger rigs. Um, it's good to be a strong, confident rider to ride with these. The one on the top left, actually, the pilot actually has a trike with making it very stable. Um, but they're definitely doable and usable. It's just, you just have to take practice, do a little bit of practice, take time to practice, practice with your kids, practice without your kids, practice in a parking lot, something like that, you know, before you go out on the road. Um, the turning radius is often, you know, greater. You can imagine turning these rigs around, some of them would be a little tricky. So you just have to plan ahead for that. Um, one of the other things that I notice is if you come up to an intersection and you need to use the pedestrian uh, button to cross, getting these onto or near enough to that button can be can be difficult too. But these are all things that you you learn as you go, and then you devise ways around them. I'm just kind of raising raising them as points, but it, they're actually kind of really fun fun ways to get around as a family. Um, yeah, so I'll just let Bronwyn talk a little bit about the next uh, step, which is about Sounds the independent pilot. Thanks. Uh, this is this is the the age group that I'm dwelling into right now. I mean, Cindy's kind of had that with her son growing up, and and both my kids, or at least my two year old, um, which is in the photo there. He's the little guy in the middle. That's his little bike gang that he rides with a lot of days. Um, and they definitely can start riding bikes earlier than you think. Um, there's lots of toys, you know, indoor toys and outdoor toys. Um, and kids like to start, you know, sitting on things and you know, moving with their feet. So strider bikes are a great way to kind of introduce bikes to, to kids. So a strider bike is just a pedalless bike. Strider is a company and they, and they make their own bikes, but there's other bike options out there. Uh, these ones are wooden bikes. So just a little bit more of a, a nice, nicer looking bike that you can use inside or outside um, there as well. So they learn to balance more easily. So that's kind of the main focus of these Strider bikes is that they're not as much about moving forward until they've learned to balance and then they just use their feet to, to, to move. So they almost kind of start running, but they're learning their balance as well. Um, the company Strider has a great guide, if you, anyone's interested in this, on their website um, that gives you some really good pointers about how to start um, younger kids on these bikes and then also how to continue them and um, step into the next steps there. Um, tricycles are another great way to start. They'll start learning how to use the pedals. Um, I do find that with tricycles, you have to make sure the size is right for the kid because a lot of times their feet need to be right on those pedals so that they can get the full rotation there as well. Um, they're basically at this stage, they're learning the bike handling skills first and before they move on. Um, as they move into that next stage, um, training wheels are another good option on a bigger bike because it gives them that balance and then they can focus on other things like braking and steering as well. Um, just all these Thoughts are great for learning, you know, on, on quieter streets, cul-de-sacs, basketball courts, empty parking lots, trails, um, lots of things like that. Just be mindful, thinking about longer rides, um, that they're not really going to happen in this in this age group. Mm -hmm. um, it's good just to be realistic, and I, I myself and experience have felt this, where I feel like we can go further than he actually can end up carrying him and carrying the bike or you know putting them on the stroller so i think just being realistic about their abilities at this age is just kind of exposure time there so um 
education for children and youth. Bike to Work Society offers um, a lot of courses and that kind of from the bike to work name doesn't really show that to a lot of people. So it's kind of surprised a lot of people, but um, typically in a normal year, uh, there's a lot of courses offered through um, elementary and middle schools. Unfortunately, this year is you know, much different for everybody um, as well through rec centers and other community resources and uh, primarily grade four and five range and then a, a middle school range as well for different types of courses. Um, so none of those courses are happening this year, unfortunately, but hopefully by next year or, or later this year, they'll be happening. Um, there is an event this um, August happening, I believe at the end of August, um, for in the Burnside Gorge neighborhood area for younger riders, kind of between three and six years old. So if anyone has that kind of age group, um, again, keep a lookout. There'll be some pieces of information coming out there. Um, the Hub, which is a Victoria, or Vancouver based non for profit organization, uh, recently released uh, this um, course online. It's called Learn to Ride, and it's free and it's geared towards you know, children about nine to 12 years old. Um, it's interactive um, course. So uh, they're welcoming anyone to to do it so it can be an adult course too so again it um just details parts of the bike the safety parts um riding so really good resource if you um want to take a look at that there uh, pedal heads is a company that's offering bike camps and classes i don't know if many people have heard of that but they are running through the summer i did actually see them um i forget what park that is but off of uh, mckenzie they were operating through there uh, recently. It definitely is a, you know, a scary thing to take your children out on the road for the first time. Um, but by practicing or doing some of these courses, um, building that confidence up in them and as well um, with you knowing that, um, that you feel confident in the riding and, and um, riding together. Okay, and so by doing that, another great way to help them build skills is through games. So using a driveway, flat, flat area, parking lot, basketball courts are great. Um, just finding a safe place to practice um, is a great opportunity. Using chalk is a really good um, way to kind of create something exciting that's, you know, temporary as well. Making obstacle courses um, can be a really fun way to um, you know, get kids to be creative and build their own, and then also um, adding in some some skills and, and such there. Um, so these are just a few ideas to get kind of the, the ball rolling for you if you think about next time you're out with your kids. So um, one that we do these in the courses as well, we, we do one called obstacles. And what we do is we get the kids to draw out different things that they might see when they're out on their road as obstacles or hazards. So broken glass, potholes, water, cars, bikes, people walking. And what we do is we get them to draw that kind of in a certain area, like a 10 by 10 um, foot square. And then we get them to ride through and ride around all those obstacles. So, you know, two part thing, they start thinking about things they might see on the road and then they're practicing their handling skills, trying not to um, run over the chalk obstacles. Another um, game that we like to play in some of the courses is called Catch a Falling Star. Um, again, using chalk, just drawing stars out on the road and zigzag format, kind of however you like. You could do the Milky Way or the, the Big Dipper, um, and then they ride through all those stars. More, more options, Simon Says is a really good one that you can incorporate. You know, Simon Says, turn left using your arm signals. Um, Simon Says, pat your head, those types of things. Um, another one that uh, good for a couple of riders together is red light green light and making sure everybody stops on the red light this is one that i use with my little guy um the red light green light but i because he's so little i just say red light means stop green lights mean to go and again i kind of do that on a fun area so that when i'm just builds my confidence to know that when i'm staying out on the road that he's gonna listen to me or start incorporating those things and, and connecting them 
practicing me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, a good uh, segue because uh, communication is one of the points yeah. I think that I am going to bring up here. Um, so yeah, so now we'll just get on, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the actuality of riding together and some of the things you could think about. Um, I think these are the key points um, on the slide, basically just choose distances that are short enough that it's enjoyable and fun to ride with your family and um, adjust the expectations to age and ability. And um, I've learned this through, um, like as Bronwyn actually mentioned too, uh, <laughs> I guess my own experience, uh, I still remember doing a really dumb thing uh, once expecting my very, I, he was quite small and maybe four or five years old, expecting him to ride up this quite steep hill, if anybody you know the, know the Leyritz Park area and the trail leading up to Leyritz Park and he had a tiny little bike yeah. And uh, I, what was I thinking? But, you know, as an adult, you're used to having your large bikes, your gears and the strength to to travel up these hills. And it's, you know, it's doable. Yeah, it looks like a mountain to a little one. So, you know, adjust your expectations <laughs> and uh, um, take snacks and water. That's a big one. People are happy if they're well fed and and, you know, have something to drink. But I think as parents, we all probably know this uh that you know it's really important that these are the things you learn from your children um and then uh choose safe fun routes with destinations to look forward to so um when you go out for rides especially in the beginning with your family um it's really important that everybody just has a good time and so usually if you pick a destination that everybody's excited about getting to and not just a destination but maybe waypoints that you can stop uh, along the way that um, that make it fun, like playgrounds, stop for ice cream, you know, do that kind of thing, whatever, maybe you know, not into ice cream, whatever, some treats, um, you know, then generally that kind of goes a long way to making it all enjoyable and having them want to come out again on a bike. And then also I just added a point about modeling good bike habits. So your kids learn a lot from you when they are riding with you, even if they are still just on in a trailer or you know, on a car seat or a long tail or whatever. Um, because it's amazing what they pick up in terms of traffic knowledge and how you're acting in the traffic, how you're how you're moving your bike, where you're moving your bike, that kind of thing. So if you model that, um, it goes a long way. And finally, um, communicating. And just as Bronwyn said, um, if you could communicate um, both before, during, and after your ride. So and. Uh, this obviously depends on you know how old your kids are but it can be as is from that young age of just knowing red is stop green is you know green is go um to just letting your 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 family know and everybody that you're riding with that we're going to go here you know we're going to stop there at that intersection we're going to pull over and we're going to use the crosswalk you know that kind of thing and i know as a cycling instructor and probably bronwyn does this too um we'll often uh break our uh the uh, practice rides into segments and then we'll pull everybody together at a particular segment at maybe at the end of a segment and just before the next segment and talk about what's coming up and what we're going to do in those particular places and how did everybody manage in the last little one this might be, you know, for the older kids when you're really starting to teach them, maybe the nine year olds, eight year olds, 10 year olds. Um, but if you can just kind of regroup and talk about that, then it just kind of gives everybody a chance to stay on the same page. And then you're not surprised at an intersection when your children goes through, child goes through, and then you're, you're stuck on the other side, um, you know, at a light or something like that. Um, so the actuality of riding with 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 your family, um, this uh, when they finally it seems like forever, but when they finally do start riding their own bicycles, and you're riding with them on the road, um, there's this thing in in BC we're not allowed to ride side by side on streets uh, as cyclists. Um, so you can't do what it what is shown in this photo, um, which is to ride side beside your child sort of guiding them as to you know what's going to happen next on the road kind of thing you know you're sort of shepherding them along here but we can't really we can't do that legally you have to ride in front or behind and there's pros and cons to both but i think i've kind of settled on what i've um, described here which is uh, you ride slightly overlapping and behind to the left of your child and um, that way 
they're a little bit closer to the curb, but always make sure they're a meter from parked cars. That's my key thing. But and then you can ride out a little bit from them, but stay in earshot and then you can give instructions, chat, talk, etc. And um, you still feel like you're you're kind of within you have a little bit of control over what you know what, what's happening. Um, I, oh yeah, and another point is it is legal to ride side by side on our multi-use multi trails like the Goose or the NN or Lockside Trail. Just single up if you approach somebody or if somebody's trying to pass you from behind. But you can actually ride side by side on our trails. Um, yeah, so the trails uh, brings us to the route selection. So it's really important when you ride with your kids to make sure you plan ahead what your routes are. Um, generally, of course, we want to look for quiet, flatter streets, um, look for places where you can cross roads that have intersections or marked cro crosswalks. Like I said before, destinations, parks, playgrounds, beaches, ice cream, stuff like that. And um, a note, like if you live in a neighborhood like I do, uh, with lots of cul-de-sacs, the, they're dead ends for cars, but often for pedestrians or cyclists, you can get through some of those cut-throughs. So you can link routes together on quiet streets um, using these neighborhood cut-throughs, which is, you know, which is nice. And how do you find these routes? I'm sorry for this banner that keeps coming up. My arrows don't work very well, so I'm using my my mouse to forward the slides. But um, yeah, so for finding uh, routes, I really like using uh, Google Maps Street View because you can literally take the pedestrian and drop the pedestrian on an intersection or a route, a road, a street, and check out the street characteristics. You can, you can get a sense of how busy it might be, how wide it is, how many parked cars there are. In this case, you can see a crosswalk and a trail that you could probably use to cut through with, on your bicycles. And in fact, this one is actually marked as a cycling route in Gordon Head. Um, another great resource is a CRD bike mount. Um, it, it'll show routes that have um, bike infrastructure, so bike lanes. Um, it shows, I don't have the most up-to-date one, so probably Justine could, could correct, correct me, but um, I think it also shows like comfort levels. So you can sort of uh, see, for, for example, I think Blanchard Street is a good one. Blanchard Street has a bike lane, a painted bike lane, but it's very busy high volume and a narrow bike lane. And I don't think, I mean, you know, obviously that's not one that you're gonna take your small children on, <laughs> you know, even though it is a, you know, it has bike infrastructure. So the CRD bike map shows, you know, would show that as not having, a, yeah, she's got one right there, uh, <laughs> would have not having, um, you know, it wouldn't have a high comfort level, for example. So the CRD bike map will show routes that you're going to feel good and safe on versus those that you're not maybe going to feel as safe on. And then you can adjust what route you want to take based on the level of your, your the riding skills that you have and that you have for your family. And then another great resource is simply to ask other family cyclists. Um, there's a lot of family cyclists in Victoria and I'm really excited because the, they're growing and I'm seeing more and more families out biking and um, we'll talk I think uh, Brahman has a slide with resources. So there's a there's a Facebook group that maybe some of you even uh, belong to that uh, you can post questions about gear or routes or um, whatever to, to people there. And you know they're more or less usually very happy to to answer and provide their experience and, and advice. Um, I'll also mention our multi-use trails. Um, most of you are likely familiar with the ENN trail, uh, the Galloping Goose, the Lockside Trail. They're mostly great for families. Um, they can be very busy because they're so popular. So they can be very busy on the weekends, um, particularly. And uh, so it's really important that everybody practices good trail adequate etiquette. Um, what I mean by that is, um, let's see, I do have here. I've got it all written down here for myself, so I remember. But um, basically, it's just to keep right, keep right on the trail, except to pass. If you're going to pass, shoulder check signal and then pass using the left lane when there's no oncoming traffic it's a lot like you know driving a car basically if you're drivers um warn people when you pass them with your voice or use a bell if you've got one and then also pass with enough distance so you don't in case you startle people they're often startled if you pass them and so and keep your keep your speed down 
and watch for dogs and leashes and, and other kids and family groups. Because uh, sometimes people will step out in front of you when you try to pass because they, they think they're getting out of your way. Um, and like I mentioned before, you can ride side by side on the trails, but single up um, if you're approaching others or if somebody you think is wanting to pass you. Um, and yeah, finally, uh, just uh, uh, I'm going to mention our all ages and abilities routes that we're, we're getting more and more of these in the region and, and really they're fabulous for family cycling. Um, you know, we've got routes now on Pandora, Fort Street, um, the, the new Wharf Street line, and Dallas Road is is uh, paved and you can actually use it. Um, I think right now it's it's open for multi multi purpose use, so you're going to have pedestrians and cyclists on it. But I I think it was intended to be a, a bike lane, protected bike lane. But um, but because of COVID right now, it's great because it's giving everybody a lot more room to to walk and bike and be out. But yeah, Dallas Road is another one. And then I know in Saanich, there's a piece near the Lockside Trail on Borden, and there's various bits and pieces elsewhere in the region. And um, they really do make it easier for people to get out with their families. And you can watch for the special bike signals too, um, because often the intersections are signaled specifically for bicycles. And uh, so this really helps get, you know, you can travel through the downtown quite safely. Um, um, on your bicycle and there's some new ones coming up uh there's a new route that in various other parts of the city so in the next few years we're going to have more of these all ages and abilities routes so um, i'm really excited about that and i just put this in as kind of a fun thing i'm wondering if anybody will be able to guess where this is i'm going to play it a little bit um it's just a short video oh can anybody hear that i, I never thought to check the Okay, well, we'll just go with the visual. <laughs> anyway, that is a Canadian city. And if you didn't guess, it's actually in Toronto, downtown waterfront area. I was there riding with my my son and, and husband um, probably uh, three years ago now. And uh, we used a bike share, they had a bike share, uh, they have a bike share system there. So we were able to use the bike share and get around by bikes. Uh, they don't have a great network there, but their, their rudel on the waterfront is very nice. And uh, I think that's about it for me, but I'm gonna hand it over to Bonwin for uh, to talk about a few of the resources you can use to, I don't know, plan your rides and learn a bit more about cycling. Thanks, Denise. So uh, bike to work victoria.ca is a great resource. Um, this spring, we've come up with scavenger rides, discovery rides. Um, there's a resource library on there as well, and some maps. So really good spot um, that we've expanded um, some types of things you can do with your with your kids and also look for in the resources there's you know some how to's and learning opportunities there um, as well I we put the email in there for admin at bike to work.ca so if you do have any questions or anything um, it's an easy email in and can kind of guide you to the right spot if you do have questions about routes or bikes or anything like that uh, the can bike website can bike is um, an organization that um, has certified instructors doing um, courses and on their website as well they've got some really good videos um, for how to and uh, learning stuff there. Strider Bike as I mentioned before they have a guide on their website it's kind of a PDF document but they have a few different types of guides for introducing the Strider Bike and then also introducing pedals and such like that. Um, Family Cycling Victoria which as Cindy mentioned is a Facebook group that I actually just myself um, found it yesterday and, and I'm waiting pending approval, but um, it sounds like it's a great group locally based in Victoria that can kind of connect with a lot of questions or just, you know, at least sort of getting more information across or any questions you can ask there too. Lots of the bike shops are family friendly um, and, you know, we're not supporting one or the other, but these ones that we've kind of seen have more of a family presence there as well. And um, then an, an, a really good book that's got a family cycling chapter uh, by Ellie Blue is called Everyday Bike Bicycling. Um, 
that's a good one to check out. And um, I think that's about it. So again, thank you everybody for um, partaking and listening. We've got you know, such a broad spectrum of family cycling and how to capture all that, but we hopefully um, have included a lot of pieces from, you know, beginning to ride to, you know, 16 year olds riding on their own and, and learning that piece as well. Thank you so much, Bronwyn and Cindy. Uh, we currently don't have any questions. If folks do want to still um, have their questions put into the webinar, we still have time. Um, also, there are uh, a couple emails that you can contact. Um, I can share my screen, uh, which has just a bit more information. Um, let me try. So, um, coming up next week, we have uh, another great webinar that's going to be actually hosted uh, by some other cycling instructors who are involved with the Bike to Work Society, as well as uh, Karen Labrie from bikemaps.org. Um, these are all of our uh, social media and websites. Uh, this is my email. Um, I encourage everyone to check out our neighborhood rides, our cycling resource library, as Bronwyn just mentioned. Um, and we're always looking for uh, donations or for folks to become members, uh, just because we want to be, be able to uh, continue offering these types of um, events for free. Um, and we really appreciate everyone who has participated today. I really appreciate uh, Cindy Brown coming on. Um, still doesn't look like we have any questions, um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, oh, we do from Amanda. Um, Amanda asks, uh, I missed part of it, so you might have covered this, but can you help with understanding bike sizing? Um, I'm wondering uh, if Ron Winners and Dee want to take this over. I can chat a little bit. We didn't really cover that specifically, um, but the best kind of way to kind of start that is if your child can step over um, step over the bike and you know comfortably hold the handlebars and stand on the ground. So they want to, you know, like that part of their, you want to be able to them to comfortably get on and off the bike. And then from there you can size the, the um, seat. And as well for the pedals, you want to make sure that they can, once you adjust that seat, that, that they can bring their foot from like a 90 degree turn um, to a straight with one, one stride on the pedal kind of a challenging thing um, to think about. But uh, I, I think a lot of people uh, will buy their kid a, a bigger bike, um, expecting them to grow into it, but also just to be mindful of that the seat does adjust, um, but you also need that kid or child to be able to comfortably get on and off. It's kind of a key point. Um, but finding bikes that even sometimes the handlebars can adjust, or you can buy different components that would change the um, the length of the handlebar from the post there uh, and same with the seat which definitely changes for the, the pedals and such like that yeah i guess that is kind of a concern just with kids growing so quickly like growing out of their bikes really quickly yeah. um but i think generally like kids and child's bikes are pretty um affordable i think but, it definitely varies mm -hmm. uh, and definitely a used bike option is a, a good place to start. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if Recyclista does, um, they sell used bikes as well, or different components too, which would be a good spot to start um, mm -hmm. looking for that there too. Cindy, any experience? Uh, yeah, we started, I think our son's first bike was one that the neighbor gave him and it was small. It was a good size for him, so it, was, it worked perfectly. And then, yeah, we just, um, we would, we actually, at the, I don't know if Russ Hayes still has it, but at the time they had a program where you could buy a bike and then the next year you could bring it back, or I think it was within the year, you could bring it back and then trade up for a bigger one. Oh, wow. And, and mm -hmm. it was it was affordable, um, but you still, you know, you got a, you got a good bike. 
but definitely secondhand is great because people are, we're all in the same boat. So, you know, parents, when they're, you know, their child grows out of a bike, they're, yeah. they're willing to, you know, sell it. So yeah, just keep your eyes open for, for bites and, uh, you know, in whatever used, uh, you know, platform you you like to use and, uh, you'll probably find something. Yeah. yeah. That's a good thing to do. Make sure though, I, I always like to take it to a bike shop, make it, check it over, make sure it's in good shape. You don't want the handlebar coming off or the pedals flying off or anything like that. So yeah. if I use one, get it, take it in and get it checked out unless you're good at doing that yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I have one more question and then I think we'll wrap up from here. Okay. It's from Richard and he says, have any of you been to the bike track in View Royal? If so, is there a good age to bring kids out there? And is it a fun place for young kids? Mm. I've actually taken my little two-year-old out there um, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And um, so, you know, the pe age groups that were there, I mean, two to 16, I think there was even a couple older adults, but mainly just a big range of abilities too. So everyone was very respectful about, I basically walked beside him and he didn't, you know, go through all of the, the track there, but, um, it was great to see him kind of push his confidence and um, yeah, I'd, I'd welcome or encourage anyone of kind of any ability to go because that everyone gave him lots of space and, you know, finding, thinking about if you're nervous to go, is go at a quieter time, which typically probably be in the morning or weekday morning. Um, mm -hmm. But it definitely was great to see how many children were out there mm -hmm. and, and youth using it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, um, you know, on the more of the sports side of, of cycling, um, the velodrome is great. Uh, not for the small oh, kids, but as they get a bit, you know, maybe, I, I'm not sure what age they start them out there, but even nine, 10, 11, 12, I don't know. But it's, it, that's a lot of fun. And you learn great bike handling skills out on the, uh, the velodrome track. And um, yeah, they're a great community of people too. I know we know some of the folks that, that ride out there. So. It's fun. And also um, some of the bike shops have youth oriented um, cycling groups for road riding as well. So it's, um, yeah, so you can sort of poke around for that if you have kids that are a little bit older um, that, that might be interested in that. Yeah, yeah our, um, our kids cycling skills at the Bike to Work Society, we're hoping to get those actually started up again in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, right, yeah. And then those start uh, with usually kids around seven, mm -hmm. uh, seven years old. We're looking for kids who mostly know how to ride bikes already, but um, we're also going to be, um, I think Bronwyn mentioned uh, hosting a, another like like first riders cycling event um, at uh, the Burnside Gorge Community Center. And then they also have one of those fun like bike track things that I actually mm -hmm. tried out on my road bike the other day and was a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I saw lots of little kids there. That was, which is great. Yeah. yeah, that's another spot that I've been meaning to take, to take mm -hmm. in this exposure, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, we're all finished up now. So um, thank, you. thank you everyone for, for participating. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Bronwyn and Cindy. Uh, I hope to see everyone at our next webinar. Uh, we're doing them for the rest of the summer. And uh, have a great Saturday and keep riding with your kids and spread the good news. <laughs> <laughs> great, thank you. Thanks, Bye. Brian. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Bye-bye. Yeah.